Mohan Das Pai, uh, Chairman Manipal Global, also President of uh, AIMA. Uh, he's, he has, you know, a great track record, but also very, very strong views and vision on some of the disruptive changes happening in the country. Um, and one topic I know he loves to talk about, and I am completely aligned with your thoughts, is that change is happening, but how do we prepare for it? I think that's a fundamental issue. Leadership also means preparing yourself and others. And Mohan, for, for your information, yesterday we did a small exercise where everybody, we asked them, apart from what they're doing, they also talked about how they are disruptors and innovators in their own way. So, and we realize that disruption is not negative necessarily. It's something which they are contributing, living and breathing every day. So, over to you. Uh, thank you, Penjal. Uh, folks, I'm going to talk on leadership in the age of disruption. We've chosen that as a theme for IMA this year for various reasons. Because we believe we are in the midst of the greatest disruption in human history. I think it's important for us to understand what is happening around the world, what the impact is and how things are going to change, and what are the big mega forces at work. So let's go back a little bit into history. For thousands of years, civilizations were built on human muscle and animal power. It implied that countries which had a lot of people became rich. So India and China, from the dawn of civilization till about 1820, made up 45% of world GDP. India had the largest share of world GDP for the longest period of time, for a thousand, a few thousand years since the start of the Christian era. And then China took over, then India again. And the reason is very clear. They had a lot of people. They were on the banks of rivers. Civilization flourished. And where human, human beings are, human beings tend to specialize. And they specialize. They had arts. They had crafts. They had big temples. They had pyramids and all kind of structures. It is all driven by human power and animal power. So civilizations were configured very differently. Then 200 years ago, one event happened which changed the world. And that event was the invention of the steam engine. Suddenly what happened? You discovered motive power. That means you could burn coal, heat water, and dry machines. And when you burn coal, heat water, and dry machines, you create large machines, you create factories, you create centralized production where there was standardization, there were large scale production, there was reduction in the cost of manufacture because not dependent on people. And human beings became widgets who could, could employ, exploit them because a lot of them floating around. And you could build a different kind of a structure globally. And it happened also because from 1500 onwards when trade with India started with Vasco da Gama coming here. I think he went to Kerala first, then he came here and took over this place. The spice trade created a new class of people who were merchants. Till then, the social construct was they were lords and kings who had land. And land was the primary source of wealth. And if land is the primary source of wealth, it means the people who control land control the people on the land. And the people who were agriculturists were essentially serfs, are what you call tenant farmers who produce from the land. And this lord took away a lot of stuff from them. And he made them part of the war effort. So whenever there was war, they all came along with him. So they were lots. That was the social construct. And suddenly, you had these merchants going and trading, creating, you know, getting spices from India, selling it. And we have seen Marco Polo go from China on the Silk Road to Venice. Venice had become a city state. It started in Europe for various reasons, because India and China were rich countries. And India and China traded with Europe through the Arabs. The Arabs came in the Daos around the coast of India and went along to Indonesia, and then they traded with the, with the Europeans to the landlocked route, because they knew the sea route all the way up to Venice and Italy. And the Chinese had the route to the Silk Route, and that's the way the world was. But these merchants made trade and had high profits, because the alternative was the land route, which was very expensive, and that led to accumulation of capital. And they were the early venture capitalists. So they funded these factories, and uh, we saw the steam engine, the steam engine coming, factories were built, factories produced goods. For that, they went to, the call, they went to the countries like India to get cotton. Textiles is a big business. Uh, till then, Indian textiles dominated the world. Indian textile was exported till this factory started, since started trading. Uh, if you see uh, movies about old Rome, the Roman toga, 
That's all Indian cotton. Because Pliny, Pliny the Elder wrote 2,000 years ago that trade with India will impoverish Rome. Because Rome got spices and textiles from India, and India demanded gold and silver. And for gold and silver, they had to sack countries. They had to go conquer countries, take away the gold. Because gold was not easily available. Whoever had gold, they had to sack them, take it away, and use it as a means of trade. So they used to buy these luxuries. They were luxuries for them. And till then, clothing was all essentially wool or maybe animal clothing. There's nothing like cotton, which was very light with breathers. And in a you know, warm climate, it worked fairly well. So you had this trading class come up. And the trading class started moving money. And that led to expansion of shipping. That led to building of large factories. That led to colonization of India and uh, China. And that led to a flow of wealth from the east to the west in a very massive way. There's a book by Will Durant. Will Durant is an American historian who came to India in 1930 and wrote a book. He said, he wrote in the book that the British took away $400 billion of money from India in 1930 money. From 1857 to 1930, they took away this money to build the Industrial Revolution. Uh, 125 of the 200 richest families in Great Britain got their wealth from India. We know how Robert Clive looted Nanda Kumar, who was a rich Bengali <laughs> in Calcutta. We know what they did, the looting that happened. So money flowed from here. Money flowed from China, too. Uh, so that is the kind uh, of the change and the deception that took place. And within 30 years, 1820, 1850, 50 years, 1870, the role changed. Suddenly, Europe became the engine of power, the biggest economy, India, China, went down because they missed the Industrial Revolution. They were colonized. And because of the availability of capital and innovation, the Industrial Era came into being. The Industrial Revolution, Industrial Era, driven by the steam engine. And along with the steam engine came the steam locomotive. Then came the IC engine. Then came the steamboat, where you used coal and to burn steam so you could go faster. Shipping developed, everything developed, modern commerce developed, trade developed, everything things went on, right? And by 1900, Europe was fairly developed, and European capital was going to America to build uh, America's infrastructure. The robber barons had come. And you see these things happening. Remember, it happened in 50 years. Just 50 years. The world changed. The world changed. And then the political construct on the world at that point of time were great empires. Look, go back to 1900 and see how the world was, how the world uh, in Europe, you had the Tsar, the Russian Empire. They've been around since 600 years, I think 12th century. And then you had the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, been around till again the 12th century. And then you had the French Republic, which France had become a republic because of the Napoleonic War, the French Revolution. The Germans had a Kaiser and the Emperor, and they were developing as an industrial nation. Right? The British had an empire. And the Middle East, you had the Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire had conquered that part of uh, Asia and Europe at that point of time, taken away the Eastern Roman Empire in Constantinople. They conquered that, and they made it the capital. And you come east, uh, the Mughal Empire was gone because India at that point of time was colonized. There were some kingdoms, and there was peace. Then you go further east, you had the uh, Chinese Empire, 2,500 years. And then you had the, Russia, the, the Japanese king, right? who saw his descent 2,500 years ago. And this is the construct of the world. And Africa was getting conquered. The white man was going there. You know the story. When the white man came to Africa, the black man had the land, and the white man had the Bible. Very soon, the black man got the Bible, and the white man got the land. That was the terms of trade. So the whole, whole continent was gone. So the exploitation and all the wealth went. Then in 1914, in a place called Sarajevo, one event happened. which showed the world the impact of this machine age. An anarchist shot Archduke Ferdinand, who was the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire at that point of time. Okay, an anarchist. Because in Serbia, the Austro-Hungarian Empire had conquered that. And here, when he's going, uh, it, it, it seems that the car they were going, and there were automobiles then, the car they were going took a wrong turn, and this man got on and back. And that started the First World War. But before the First World War, if you go to Tony Selba on the web, you see a remarkable thing. 1900, there's a picture of New York, the streets of New York, all horse-drawn carriages and one car. 1910, all cars and one horse-drawn carriage. And in 1900, the fear in New York was New York will be drowned by 11 meters of horse shit. 
because horses excrete a lot. They eat excrete, right? And there's so many carriages coming up. But in 10 years, horses which dominated locomotion and travel for thousands of years were gone. It's automobile age. So the IC engine age, the steamboat age, mechanization, power generation, AC, DC, Tesla's invasion, Edison, invasion, all the things came up during that period, right? And it epitomized in the war. The war started. Austria, Hungary had a treaty with Germany, and the, both of them went and conquered Serbia, and they moved, and then France protested because France had a treaty, and France was attacked, and the French and the English had a treaty, and these countries fought with each other. The World War started. When the World War started, it started with cavalry, with infantry, troops stuck in the killing fleet trenches of Flanders. Flanders is in uh, Belgium, and there they dug the trenches, they stayed put, they had mustard gas, all this uh, biological warfare and chemical warfare took place, and the war ended in tanks on the ground, in icy motors, in planes in the air, and the world changed. All right, 16 million people died. 16 million people died, killed in four years. The flower of the youth of various European countries were gone. One and a half million Indian troops fought on the side of the Allies. And until the First World War, what happened? There was a revolution in Russia in 1917, and the Bolsheviks took over. The Russian communists took over, so the Tsar was gone. Austria, Hungary, the empire, the emperor abdicated. And Rekha, you know, four years back I was in Vienna, four or five years back I was in Vienna, gone for a holiday walking around, suddenly we saw the city closing down. And we walked around, we saw a procession coming. The procession had people from 50 different nationalities, with their caps, with feathers, with shorts, with those braces and everything else coming with, you know, with uh, helmets and all the things. It was the funeral of Otto von Habsburg, the last emperor who at the age of eight or ten abdicated in 1919 piece of history we witnessed it just like that in Vienna. Okay, it's a beautiful site, very poignant with history, but that's the end. So, Austria Russia is gone, Kaiser William was gone, the French never won a war since Napoleon, they were defeated, they came back, the British were enfeebled, America came into the war in 1917 and reviewed up our industry because there's no destruction there, there are two big ponds facing them and they become the great power. And the Ottoman Empire was gone. The Caliph, Caliph, remember that ISIS Caliph? The Caliph, he was the head of the Muslims for a long period of time, 600 years, because they ruled over Mecca and Medina. And every year, they used to send a caravan with cloth and jewels from Mecca and Medina for the pilgrimage and the Hajj to start. If you go to, uh, uh, you know, Istanbul, you go to that uh, palace, Tropicana, I don't know, what is the palace? You go to the palace, and there, the beautiful museum, and in that museum, you see the saddle with the prophet road, and the letter written by the prophet in Arabic to the emperors of Europe, threatening them with conquest in case they don't convert to Islam. So the prophet closed, all the clothes that went to cover the Kaaba, they're all there in that beautiful museum. All right? So, the Turkish Empire was gone with abdication, and there was Kemal Ataturk, who was an uh, army officer who had taken over that country and declared independence. And the Allies wanted to break up Turkey. They called the, Greek, see, the, the, the people from Greece to come, and there was a civil war, and they wanted to break up Turkey into bits. But uh, Kemal Ataturk came, and he fought the battle, and they gave Turkey back to him, but Turkey lost their empire. And then uh, Sykes and Pico, Two, two diplomats from the UK and France sat down in the afternoon over a cup of tea and drew the map of the Middle East. They created Iraq, they created Lebanon, Jordan, they created uh, uh, you know, the Emirates, they created Saudi Arabia, they created all those countries that you see, Cyprus, huh? Cyprus they created all the country, and all the trouble in the world today is there because they drew on the map and they forgot about tribal loyalties. They are, this was the time when Al-Sad became the consolidated power and the Wahhabis came to, it came to power with the Wahhabis. And that happened there. And they also uh, drew a line and declared that the Palestine, which was a mandated territory under the League of Nations, uh, would have the Israelis free to migrate. The problem of the Israelis goes back to 1917, when Lord Balfour made a declaration in the, US, in, the, in the UK parliament that the Jewish people will have a homeland. It's called the Balfour Declaration. 
So that problem happened. When the war ended, the world was politically changed. Four years. Politically changed. The age of empires was gone. It's big disruption, right? Age of empires was gone. All these empires ruling for 600, 700 years, royalty, the royal class, all gone. And in China, 1919, Sun Yat-sen took place. Pu Li, the last emperor of China, abdicated, and he was pushed away somewhere. And, uh, you know, the Japanese came into China, they took him to Manchuria and all that, and Japan was becoming a great empire, right? This was a scenario. Then in 1919, in a railway bogey in Versailles, near Paris, they wrote the treaty where Germany abdicated, German emperor abdicated, and Germany surrendered. And the treaty was very one-sided because they had to pay reparations and they started inflation there, the rise of Hitler and everything else happened. 1924, they signed the Treaty of Paris outlying law and all those things intervening happened. And because of what the treaty they signed in 1921, which asked for reparations from Germany, Hitler came to power because Germany was in turmoil. You know, three governments fell and there's a weak government and Hitler came to power, Hitler industrialized. So the First World War led to the Second World War and when Hitler took on Czechoslovakia, took on everything else, the world was a different place. Great Britain with colonies, Russia in the throes of a revolution, Germany becoming very powerful. The French were doing what they've been doing for a long period of time, you know, whatever they do. The British were still ruling, America was coming up, a great power. Japan was coming up, China in uh, turmoil, in the civil war. There is civil war and there are many things going. You must read the Chinese history. And then Hitler conquered and took over the whole of Europe. When Hitler went against the Poles, the Polish people, they came on horseback, cavalry. They still had cavalry. Two million Indian troops fought on the side of the Allies. The war started with cavalry. The war started with Bliski, where the Germans went with the tanks. They went with the big vehicles, and they used to go 50 kilometers. The French had a defense line called the Maginot Line, and the Maginot Line was supposed to keep all the Germans. Their sidestep, Hitler's sidestep, came from Belgium into France and took over France. Whole of Europe was conquered in a matter of six months, right? And the war map changed. The world ended in the war ended 1945. All right, 44, 45, and the war ended. When the war ended, 60 million people were killed. Six crore. 60 million people were killed. Europe was destroyed. The Soviet Union has become powerful. They lost about 20 million people. They lost about, yeah, maybe yeah, 20 million people. Largest casualties there. It is the Soviet Union which pushed back Hitler and destroyed Germany, right? England was enfeebled. Wasted all the resources, they were gone, they couldn't control the empire. America had become very powerful, an industrial superpower. And in the industrial era, they used their women to come and work in the factory. They used to build one warship a day. Huge capacity was built up, industry was built up. That laid the foundation for the future boom and the baby boomers in the United States. And that's why they became very powerful. And um, in the East, you had the civil war with uh, China. And China was conquered by Japan. And you had Chiang Kai-shek and Mao fight it out till Mao came to power in 1949. And you had the Japanese who were essentially defeated with the two bombs being placed. And the world changed. Go back, it all went to the age of the machines and the invention of the steam engine. Correct? With the rise of the machines. And that led to all this and the change in the whole political landscape, social landscape, industrial landscape, civilization is getting destroyed. So 200 years, and this time it was maybe 150 years, or 100 years of change, 1850 to 1947, just 100 years. All gone, all right? Then post-war, all the colonies were gone, India's freedom movement, the British left us and went, partition, this thing, then the whole of Southeast Asia became free, uh, Japan came up because the Marshall Plan, China became a communist, the Cold War started, the Soviet Union started all these conquered countries, get the Warsaw Pact, Europe, the Americans gave money to Germany to come up. England lost everything, became a third rate power. The second rate power became a third rate power. And America became the sole superpower. Look at the change in five years. Hitler created rockets to go to London. Americans created the autumn bomb, the ultimate weapon of destruction. Right? The war was fought in the air through planes. A lot of innovation took place. The radar came into being. You know, and all the things led to the society we are here today. So today, after maybe 70 years, 70 years, what do we see in the world? 
the rise of China, Japan becoming a power, Southeast Asia coming up, Europe coming up but stagnating, Russia, Soviet Union destroyed because of internal contradiction, Turkey still there, Middle East in turmoil, Africa still muddling through, trying to find, make sense of the countries, South America there, India free, and a very different world. And now, we are in the midst of the next big disruption, which is going to change all this in a very peaceful way. We're not going to have 100 million people die. But they're going to be without jobs. What is this big disruption that's coming? The big disruption that's coming is the internet. Why? You may laugh at me and say, oh man, internet, what is this? For the first time, 7 billion people in this planet will be on one single technological platform connected by a cheap device with unlimited data plan where they can do interaction with each other asynchronously, asynchronously, do e-commerce, get education, get health, get entertainment, get e-governance, whatever they want, together creating one single virtual world. That's the power of the web. So the contradiction between people, access to information, access to capital, access to money is all gone or is going down because they're on one single platform and the field is getting level. It's a flat world driven by the internet. At the internet, trade and commerce will move to countries where wages are lower and it's been happening for some time and we're seeing the change in the world. And this having an impact on various industries which are changing. So this disruption is now playing out in a very big way and going exponentially. Now let's look at the industries where this disruption is happening. First is the oil industry. Oil makes up 60% of world's energy. Oil, petroleum. Petroleum was uh, first used largely in uh, the United States. The US was the largest exporter of petroleum till 1971 when the prices went up because the US took Persian oil, took Arab oil, until 1971, I think, when they had the first oil crisis, the U.S. was the largest producer of oil, largest exporter of oil, and they were dominant. In 1971, we had the oil crisis because of the Arab-Israeli war, and the price of oil went up from $1 to some $10 or something like that. And the whole global economy was in turmoil. America stopped exports, and America started importing because they wanted to conserve the oil. Because the price is going up, we have to conserve it. They felt oil was a depleting reserve. Now, oil today, oil three years back was a six trillion dollar industry. The world GDP is 77 trillion, oil was a six trillion dollar industry. And the six trillion dollar industry, two trillion dollars has disappeared because Americans discovered how to get oil and tap into small pools of oil and gas to what is called fracking. Now, if you drill vertically down to tap into large oil and gas fields, now you drill vertically down and you drill horizontally. And because you can drill horizontally, you can tap into small, small pools and suck it out, and that is what is shale gas. And America's production has gone from 2 million barrels a day to 9.75 million, 9 million barrels. And because American oil and gas come in the market, the price fell from 145 to 35. Now it's gone to 55. All right? So what does it mean? Technological advance and make sure that the world has surplus oil. But that's not enough. So oil industry is getting disrupted in a very big way. And oil industry getting disrupted means the Saudi Arabia, which has $750 billion of reserves, has come down to $500 billion. Salman has come. The whole order is gone. They're all going to jail. There is turmoil in the Middle East. Venezuela is a sick state. And all these exporters used to make money by exporting oil at higher price. They're all gone. Because the commodity price, which is holding up the economies, has all come down. But there's another tech innovation, expanding supply. But then. The utility industry has undergone a massive change. In June of this year, for the first time in 200 years, 100% of the energy of the UK came through non-coal energy. No coal was burned for the first time. They had alternate energy through uh, wind, through solar, and through gas. So coal, as a motive source of power, which powered the Industrial Revolution, is gone. And Trump came and said, I'm going to have this coal miners do yay, yay, yay. It's all gone. So alternate energy is reshaping the world. About 10% of the world's energy is alternate energy. 19% of European energy is alternate energy. And by 2030, 30% of the world's energy will be alternate energy. And the impact has been the United States, the utility industry is a cell for all the analysts. And in Europe, the largest energy company, E.ON, has been broken up into two halves. One is generation, and the other one is a transmission distribution alternate energy half. 
and this alternate energy half is valued much more. So we're seeing a change in the way energy is consumed. And if alternate energy comes up, the terms of trade change. In India, we could have 175,000 megawatts of alternate energy, which is essentially wind and uh, solar. And solar energy costs have come down to rupee 50 pesa. And solar energy costs are less. Imagine a world where you have a solar panel, conversion is 18%, goes to 24%, is there in the lab. You take it, put it into storage, plug your car, and drive your car, and your car becomes a source of power. And the night, you get the car back, plug it in, and the house is lit. You don't require grid power. Energy changes. Energy is a two, three billion dollar industry, gone. And solar energy is renewable. It goes on and on. So the utility industry is changing in a very big way. And that is bringing about a tremendous amount of change. Right? Now, the next industry which is getting disrupted is the auto industry. The world makes 90 million four wheelers. Industry is two trillion dollars. 90 million two-wheelers. Last calendar year, the world had one million electric vehicles. Now, electric vehicle has 20 moving parts. An IC engine has 2,000 moving parts. An electric engine costs $1,500 to maintain and run. A IC engine costs $10,500. Now, the Chinese say by 2025, 60% of what they produce will be electric vehicles. And the Chinese produce 21 million vehicles a year. And India says by 2030, we're not going to allow diesel vehicles to be sold. And Germany has said by 2030, no more diesel vehicles. The world is moving to electric cars in a very big way. An IC engine industry, which has been there for 100 years, which dominated, which produced one in six jobs from the world, is changing. And the electric car can go for 500,000 kilometers without getting destroyed. An IC engine lasts 100,000, 200,000. Right? So all the repairs cost will come down, the running cost will come down, the, and fuel cost will come down because it's not going to use petrol and diesel. 60% of the world's energy out of 60%, 60% of 60% is used by automobiles. It all stop. That is 30% of oil demand, boom, gone. It's impacting that. So the electric vehicles come, and the electric vehicles are coming up because the Tesla is selling a car at 35,000, and the electric vehicles have become a piece of software. We went to Tesla factory for Myma, and we saw the engine. They said the size of the engine is shrunk by 40% in three years. And it's a beautiful car. It makes no noise. And now you have this solar panel, storage, plug it in, bang. And the cost of the car will come to $10,000. So two wheelers will go by solar, cars will go by solar, buses will go by solar. China has got 275,000 buses on solar. In Delhi, you may actually leave again. Pollution is causing your lifespan to come down by nine years if you're in Delhi. And those of you in Delhi, be counting your lives. Go for a checkup. And UNICEF says that children who are born there can have their brain development impaired by breathing that air. Pranjal, God help all those guys who live in the streets and breathe that foul air. You also better come to Goa more time, spend time here than Delhi. Your mind is getting idled. Come, come, Bangalore. Bangalore, we got good air because we're 1,000 meters up. Delhi is down, you know, 600 meters or whatever it is. Delhi is a bowl. The whole of North India, if you look at satellite image, from Jaipur to Lucknow, the whole air is foul. In the winter, it comes down. In the summer, it goes up. There are many, many reasons, but it's accumulated over the last 20 years, and it's a mess. Whole of North India is a mess. I mean, you stay there, guys who are there, stay there. It's a good life, but, you know, whatever it is, okay? Kejriwal will have a nice time, you know, he's... Somebody is going to get him. So now, you're seeing, this, you're seeing the electric vehicle come up. And the electric vehicles come up, the number of vehicles in use will come down. And the electric vehicles are becoming autonomous. Autonomous, they're going to drive by themselves. Because they use AI, they train to machines, they got radars, they got everything else. And in Germany, trucks went 1,500 kilometers without a stop. Now, look at this data. An American truck goes 600 kilometers a day. Drivers are not supposed to work more than eight hours a day. So the truck goes, single vehicle, stops for the night. Now you can have a truck which goes 24 hours. You don't need a driver. It can go around two times. Average speed is higher. And because they can stop and they don't, they don't make accidents, insurance cost comes down. Repair cost comes down. All these guys who support ambulance cost comes down. Whole industries are disrupted. 
So there's disruption happening in the trucking industry, in the auto industry, and all this is going to change the way we live. And that along with the sharing economy, Uber, Ola, and all the sharing economy, we don't have to buy cars. The younger generation today doesn't want to buy cars. They don't want to buy houses. They can live in Airbnb because people like us have got two houses, three houses vacant. They'll go stay there. Everybody's leasing it out. The world is surplus capacity. The sharing economy means you don't buy assets. You don't buy assets. There's no production. There's no production. There's no industry. So there'll be enough auto. And this is happening faster than we believe. And it's being driven by economics. It's being driven by innovation. In a car, the major cost is the battery cost. Battery costs are coming down by 15% a year. Tesla has built a gigafactory in Nevada, which will bring down the cost by 30%. And li use lithium ion batteries, which work in serial, and the technology is very good. Now the flow batteries are coming up, new batteries are coming up, and this industry is taking off in a very, very big way. India has an electric vehicle policy too. So the auto industry is getting disrupted. Right then, that's a big industry. One in six jobs in the world. <laughs> huh? Components, component industry. All these guys, supply chain. Then, then manufacturing is getting disrupted. Manufacturing hitherto has been called, has been what is called reductive manufacturing. What do you do? You go mine ore, make into metal, melt into metal, and then you take a piece of metal and you cut it to shape, to create a part, right? That is reductive manufacturing. Now it's additive manufacturing. You take the metal, make into powder, you take plastic, make into powder, put in the 3D printing machine, and you come to a PC, and you design a car in 3D, and you press a button, and the car is printed out 30 microns by 30 microns. And today, houses have been printed out in Dubai and Netherlands. Rocket engines have been printed out. Racing engines in Australia. Parts of the skull for any emergency thing. Part of your bone has been printed out. Uh, blood vessels have been printed out. Chocolates have been printed out. Most things have been printed out. Three percent of world manufacturing is now 3D printing. It will go up to 30 percent. And if that manufacturing comes up, supply chain getting disrupted. Now we have a global supply chain where oil is goes in uh, you know, uh, pipelines, it goes in ships, metals go in uh, ships, and they go and they're unloaded, trucks take everything else. Now you can have local manufacture, and the entire supply chain has led to an industrial infrastructure uh, which is centralized where you have design, you make a car, you have company manufacturer, they all come there and assemble. Now you could have a place where you could have an assembly through this machine next door. So I can sit down, talk to somebody in Bangalore, get my car designed the way I want. And I press a button, it goes next door, there's a machine and it prints it out. I get a car in 24 hours. Everybody will have a different car if you want a car. So what happened to the supply chain? What happened to the jobs? What happened to all that? The entire supply chain gets disrupted. Oil comes down, consumption comes down by 30%. Metal consumption, metal can be recycled, enough to recycle. Energy, all those grids, all those common grids could come down. Will it happen? Even if 60% of it happen, is a big change. Because they're all data sets. So 3D printing is going to revolutionize manufacturing in a very big way. By 2030, 30% of world manufacturing could be 3D printing. And you can imagine the implication of 3D printing to many, many things. In Bangalore, they're trying to print liver cells on a Petra dish. Why? Because they want to test uh, drugs, they want to test cosmetics and liquor on the liver cell. So tomorrow you like your drink, a single malt and all the nice stuff, you go through it, your liver gets damaged, you go print a part and put the liver back. Right? Malia is unfortunately in trouble, he shouldn't have, you know, he's got a beautiful house, he shouldn't have got in trouble, he should have come back, his corpus is enormous, right? So, the next area of disruption is the life sciences, and here it is big. What are the most important asset you people have? Tell me. Health, health. 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 health or wealth? Health. 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 Okay, then. Go on. Go on. Life itself. Exactly. The most important asset you have, life. And everybody tells me, you know, India should be a dictatorship, India should be this and all that, Pranjal, they don't understand anything. Where is your life safest? Democracy under rule of law and dictatorship. How are perfect? Exactly. Chaos, chaotic but rule of law. Your life is safe. Your life goes, everything is gone. Right? Huh? Like Pat, George Patton said, nobody wins a war by dying for his country. He wins a war by setting that poor dumb B dash 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 to die for the country. Others' lives are safe. I mean, you know, expendable. So, in life sciences, the most important thing you have is life. And what happens to you? You age. You grow up, 
Kohli, bang, 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 bang. The nice jokes on the web. I won't tell you the jokes about that marriage. The nice jokes about the opening batsman and all that. But whatever it is, Kohli, you know, Kohli plays cricket beautifully. 100 miles an hour, he plays six. Sevag used to play Shoaib Akhtar. He used to bounce the ball, bing, six. Why? Eye, hand, leg coordination. It works perfectly. Past the age of 30, you start aging. Why? Past the age of 30, your body cells don't regenerate the same way it did before 30. So the total number of cells, billions of cells, start deteriorating. So your eyesight dims a bit, your reflexes dims a bit, and that's why we saw Dravid go to Australia in the last series, bowled four times but didn't bat and ball. Why? Because the hand, bat, leg didn't move together, gap, and the ball came in. And we had Tendulkar cutting in the last match and giving a catch to slip. We had Kapil Dev coming and bowling the ball he was fighting till we had to kick him out. Because after 30, it comes down. Seva couldn't meet the ball. We age. Now, how do we age because of this? What triggers it? In the DNA, there's a mechanism which triggers this thing because it's all encoded. Now, with using big data and analytics, they're trying to find out how to postpone the trigger in your DNA to stop aging. And you can postpone it to 50. You age after 50, you live up to 120. And this happening, companies are being set up. It's happening in the US. Money is pouring in, and that's happening. So aging can be done. And cancer, how does cancer come? Cancer comes by the growth of unregulated cells. Your cells, something happened to your cells, and they start growing. OK? And because they start growing, metastasizing, I think, is the word. They start growing, they destroy your good cells, and you die. But they've got to find out what triggers this, stop it, or trigger the good cells to fight the bad cells. So how do you send a message to your uh, gene, to a gene, to a DNA, to start a chemical reaction? Because everything is in the DNA. The decode of the human genome, now this is all there. That can change. Right? You can take care of cancer. You can take care of aging. Robotic surgery. You sit before a screen, takes a 3D image, you know what is inside, then you press the button, the robot comes, cuts up, does something inside, finish, you go home. Today, if something happens, the doctor presses all over, he has to cut something, do it 10 hours, sew something, he leaves something inside. Just the other day, news came that a lawyer was putting his initial on somebody's liver, operating for a liver transfer, putting the initials on that. Don't know what is rubbish they do. They put it up, and again, after 10 years, you've got to go and say, open up and see what is left inside. But robots do it very fast. So the doctor who is a surgeon becomes a computer operator. Da Vinci is the company that's doing this. All right? Then, medicine. 30% of all medicine doesn't suit you because it doesn't suit your DNA. By doing genetics testing and DNA testing, you're able to design the chemical compound to meet your DNA so you get the right kind of medicine in the right kind of place. And then you can send micro robots inside the bloodstream to go to the place and repair and do something else. And if you have plaque in your uh, you know, blood vessels, you can send the robot to clean it up. All these are happening. And so we're seeing this kind of a innovation and disruption coming in medicine, coming in diagnosis, coming in all this. And big data diagnosis. IBM Watson has got 45,000 cases of cancer in oncology. We bought it in a hospital, so doctor goes, makes a diagnosis, put all the symptoms, and Watson in one minute comes out and says, whether right or wrong, because it compares the database of 45,000, looks at all the symptoms, and comes and says, you've got to do this. So more and more cases come up. It's happening in a very big way. The whole area of human activity, human life, is expanding in a big way. And then they're also seeing, what do you do with diet? What do you do with everything else? And all that is coming into, uh, into medicine. Right? And it means people who are rich are going to live longer. And people who are poor like us, we only have to pray. So the gap between the rich and the poor is going to expand. The rich are going to live longer. Rajiv, 150 years, man. You're going to be around a long time. Pranjal, better write a few more books. You need more royalty. So things are going to change in medicine and life sciences, I think, is a very big way. Genetic testing is coming. And the biggest innovation of all, your brain. Your brain is a fantastic piece of engineering. It's got 82 billion neurons. Neurons and synapses, they connect with each other. So all your emotions, love, hate, uh, you know, anger, everything is a chemical reaction. Because it's all in the brain. So I sees, everything sees, recorded, the brain interprets. Now how does the brain work? The brain works through weak electrical impulses. 
So they're trying to map the brain by brain research and finding out how to manipulate these weak electrical impulses. In rats, they run experiments whereby they, by sending weak electrical impulses, they can make the muscles twitch. So tomorrow, with the device, I'll know exactly what you're thinking, and I can send thoughts and actions into your mind, zap you, you'll do what I want. Go vote for me in that machine. I think, Mohan, they might want some questions. We have about 20, 25 minutes okay, left. Okay, I'll finish. Another five minutes. So life science is changing. And then you are seeing change in education. Education is 1.0, Gurukul, 2.0, industry, 3.0, where you study what you want, you do what course you want, you get whatever credits you want. A virtual university will take all the credits, give you a degree. And the employer will say, I want a person who knows artificial intelligence with music and dance, with logic and everything else, and you can take that. That's getting disrupted. Finance. The banking system is getting disrupted because the loan system is getting disrupted. The startups have got $500 million who, if you go give your other number, they'll find out your background, give you everything else, do a credit check, give you a credit score, and give you a loan. And they're not learned how to get it back, but they're giving you a loan right now. Guys, better go take the money. So credit system. Investment. Robofinance is coming. Robofinance for investment. ETFs are coming. Algorithm trading is coming. The entire financial system is getting disrupted. And then you're having a very large thing Disruptive capital. Capital is coming in and more and more money. There's $8 trillion of money at zero interest rates right now. I think they come up to 0.2%. And this money is being used because there's massive liquidity to pump into innovation. So innovation cycles have come from 36 months to 18 months. Now, what does all this mean? All this means the pace of change is going up rapidly. And in every facet of human activity, there's disruption happening. And this disruption is all coming to a crescendo. And when the crescendo happens, the world changes. And what does it mean for jobs? The three kinds of jobs. The first kind of jobs are the jobs with the left brain, right brain, creativity, and logic, like a designer, like an architect, like a dancer, that will remain. The second kind of jobs are low-level jobs, like a master, hairdresser. That may remain. It is not cost to have a robo. But the middle class, middle class jobs, 65%, where they go to hobbies and do all kinds of stuff on the PC, they're all getting you know, crushed because of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and machines are going to take over. And then we're going to see robots come into manufacturing. In the auto industry, the entire manufacturing is made by robots. And we're going to have drivers doing robots. All the Star Wars guys are going to be robots. We've got drones going to Waziristan and bombing all the jihadis. So we're going to have robots go with guns to fight battles. And they're going to be controlled from somewhere else. And if you go to the web, you see a robo which does a black flip. Have you seen that? Go and Google. You guys got to go get your get to act together. Go Google. The Boston, robo stands. The Boston Dynamics has been it flips apart. It does a black flip and lands on his leg. And the robot in MIT, which a robot of a cheetah, which can, you know, training to run at 60 kilometers an hour and won't take a real cheetah. So robotics, automation, and IT is driving all this. Because in IT, you have the cloud, unlimited capacity, unlimited computing power at a very low cost. You have AI, you've got ML, all the nice stuff, and the world has become a grid. On top of that, you've got this machine in your hand. Three and a half billion people have got a smartphone. By uh, six billion people have had the smartphone in the next four to five years, and unlimited data, everything computing power, and you can connect to the world, and the world is my mushti. Remember the old song? Mere mushti mein dunya hai. It actually is there. Huh. See, it is there. So everything is there, and it's happening before your eyes, and it's changing the way things are. So jobs are going to disappear, and people are saying the best solution for all of you is going to be not all of you, somebody else outside. It never happens to us, it happens to somebody else. You know, they're talking about basic income. Tax the robo, give the money to the human being. Tax the robo, give the money to the human being, and this is going to change. Of course, population growth is coming down. Let me give you data. The whole of South India, Maharashtra, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Telangana, birth rate, your fertility is 1.7, replacement is 2.1. In Japan, last year, about 1.2 million people died, 850 babies are produced. Well, they're not producing enough babies. Till the age of 35, the genders are not mixing with each other. They lost interest in the opposite gender. Now, if you lose interest and don't do your work, then there will be no babies. There are no go babies. Society is gone. It's happening. American population is coming down. Soviet Union is declining. In, in, in Europe, somebody else is coming and taking over. You've seen that happen in Paris. All over the world, population growth is coming down. And it appears the Y chromosome, the male chromosome, will disappear in 125,000 years. So these two things are going to make sure the population growth doesn't happen. 
So people are trying to find solutions, and this is a disruption that's happening, and that's the world where you're going to live next 15 years. Any questions? Population in India is growing at 1.3%. It'll come to 1.1%, which is replacement. So we will find that it'll stagnate at maybe 1.5 billion and slowly start coming down. South is coming down. South India was 30% of population in 1971. In 2011, it's come to 25%. Bihar, their fertility is 3.4. UP is 2.8. Uh, you know, Rajasthan is 2.4. All the trouble is in North India. Maybe South India should become a separate country or, you know, whatever it is. We'll talk later. I mean, Mamta is going her own way, but whatever it is. And in West Bengal, fertility is 1.6. Punjab is 1.6. Kerala grew only 4.5% in the last 10 years in population. 4.5%. And most of the population increase came by the, by the Biharis coming there. 9% of Kerala is Bihari. You see Hindi signs in Kochi. Things are changing so rapidly. Any questions? Sir. Yeah. Can you give some specific examples of opportunities and companies that are cashing on on these changes? That's the next seminar. Yeah? You've got to come for that again. I can't give you all the answers in one seminar. Right, Rekha? <laughs> See, leadership has to change to meet this. How do leadership have to change? Because the topic is leadership in the age of disruption. We spoke about the age of disruption. We're in the midst of the age of disruption. Disruption is going to happen. How does leadership change? Leadership changes because one, we look at the environment and see what happens. Two, we make an assessment on the lines of business to see what happens. And third, we prepare our organizations to be flexible organizations with different lines to move, be agile, to move fast, to meet this reality. And fourth, we join the gang and become the leaders. And leadership means you're right in the front. The old story about a lion going behind five people and everybody running. But remember, it is not that you have to outrun, outrun the lion, you've got to outrun everybody else who is behind you. So the lion needs somebody else. So leadership is that. Things are going to get disrupted. They're going to get disrupted. You'll be ahead of the curve by understanding, reorienting, creating flexible organization, using pools of capital and joining the gang. Except that people can vote. And that's going to slow down things a little bit. Gatkari has said, I'm not going to allow autonomous cars in India. They want to keep the barbians at bay. Next. So there are going to be opportunities, but you've got to look at the industry, understand what is happening, and be ahead of the curve. India is 10 years behind all this innovation happening. So you've got a 10 years head start. And in ours, when GDP grows 7.5%, employment could have grown at 3, 3.5%. It'll grow at 2%. So employment intensity of things will go down. It'll still be good, except that 20 crore people, Patels, Gujars, Gijars, and all these people, who would not have educational skills, they're gone. By 2025, there'll be 20 crore young people, age group 21 to 45, with no jobs, or bad jobs. Sir, can you say? Organizations have to be flexible. They can't have rigid structures. You've got to outsource what you don't think is important, make them smaller, make them more agile, because when it's bigger, you manage yourself much more, and then face the market, and use flexible manufacturing, outsourcing, to focus on value, and delivered value, and if you do that, you'll survive. You know, Vern, I'll ask a question. Uh, this whole piece about job and work and creating enough for everybody, I'm not sure whether state governments, uh, national government, or even business leaders are really recognize the challenge. They don't know. Let me give you a piece of data in India. 15 years back to now, the banking system has gone up, I think, by about 10 to 12 times in size. Assets, liabilities, profits, operating profit, not the NPS there. Employment only 5%. 12 times and the employment is 5%. Automated. So what needs to be done? I think that's what... No, what needs to be done is you have to decide you're going to be ahead in the race. There is no... I want to be honest because Rekha doesn't like me being very blunt, you know. It's not politically, it's politically incorrect. But the honest thing is, a lot of people are going to miss out. We're going to create a social condition where, you know, give them DBT, GBT, and all the thing, and give them entertainment, Bollywood movies every day. I went to the valley and met somebody who is uh, doing all this thing. He said, kya, aage kya hoga? He said, everybody will put on virtual reality, augmented reality, live in their own world, and put a tube in the mouth, and, you know, and all that, and be there, and they get money in the bank. Huh? But you know, this is serious. I'm not joking. I don't have a solution. But everybody's saying it'll create more jobs than that. Yes, it'll create more jobs. But for jobs for whom? 
Manufacturing is coming back from America. It's fully automated. We're in the midst of industry 4.0. Industry 1.0 was the industrial revolution. Industry 2.0 was the assembly line. Industry 3.0 was the PLC machines. Industry 4.0 is IoT and uh, you know, internet and everything else with full automation. Imagine auto manufacturer. All your, uh, you know, you're going to sell through the web. You'll get the feedback. The feedback will be put into the machine. The assembly line will change. Assembly line will be reconfigured to have daily production. And all that stuff will go to your suppliers. They will send the goods or whatever it is. Are you to 3D printing? The entire chain is shrunk. And where's human interaction? There's only, uh, there's only going to be uh, data which, and the algorithm which are going to run. My friend went to China. He went to a factory one kilometer long with half a kilometer in depth. It is working. But in the dark, there are no lights. He asked them, why no lights? There are no human beings. It's fully automated. There are only robots. Robots are working. And today, the robots have dexterity in their hands. Because of dexterity, they can do assembly of iPhones. Foxconn replaced 50,000 women last year. They go replace 500,000 women for the next four or five years, putting in 500,000 robots to run those plants. Because these women went and asked for a raise. If you're in HR, you want a raise, boom, robo. The cost of a robo in America is $5 an hour, fully loaded. And they want $15 an hour minimum wage in Seattle and New York. The greedy capitalistic pigs are going to replace them by robos. Do you think it's all a fiction? It is fiction. But it's actually happening because life is stranger than fiction. Any questions? Yes, sir. So, uh, so you, you mentioned everything is automated, everything is generating no, data. I'm saying everything is getting automated. It's <laughs> yes. not yet automated, okay? Yes. Getting automated and data is generated and it will be algorithms in the future. And all the data is now being captured by U.S. companies. So, exactly. So how do you... How do India you is going to be a digital colony. Facebook owns India, Google owns India, Twitter owns India, Trump knows all your data, your digital footprint is available to him, the NSA is looping on you and we are in trouble. So, so That's why we need a data privacy law, we need a data residency law in this country to keep all the data here. And, and what's happening on huh? that? You, you better you could protest men, march in the street and tell Modi we want the law, we're all demanding the Sri Krishna Commission has put up a paper, it may happen. We'll have data centers in India, our data will reside here, it has to be mass because the data is ours. And one big telecom company is saying the data belongs to individuals, if somebody wants to use the data, they've got to pay for it. And then in currency, we got the Bitcoin. Bitcoin, no? Crypto, you got money, put into dollars and go buy it. You may be a billionaire, millionaire, or whatever it is. My son bought two. Every day is going up $10,000. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. It comes down, it comes down. But limited, Bitcoin has got only 20 million. 17 million is mine. 3 million is going to be mine. It's very difficult to mine. And then are people buying. Is what $350 billion in value. So all these things, innovations are happening. Now, are they going to come together? They're coming together in some way. And the industries are getting disrupted. Oil has got disrupted. Manufacturing has got disrupted. Life sciences is getting disrupted. Right? Financial services are getting disrupted. Banks are shrinking. Physically, a bank is coming. Digital payments are going up. Modi is saying debit card may no charge up to 2,000 rupees. So make it into 10 bills, 2,000 rupees, no charge. So what happens to... Visa, MasterCard, all of the banks, the sitting ducks. So these things are happening in a rapid way. But they're very small. Boom, 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 boom. That's where the fun starts. Then they start intermeshing. That's why the digital world is a strange world where data, like somebody said, the new oil, but data should belong to you. And that's a big problem. So India may become a digital colony. In the startup world, out of 10 unicorns, 8 are outside India. And all of them are 75, 80% owned by foreigners. Facebook has two and a half billion people, right? Somebody will come and disturb them, don't worry, but your digital identity is there. Now the news is, what happens to your digital persona after you die? Somebody has it. The Europeans are passing a law that it must be killed on your demand, right? Any questions? It's not a gloomy world, it's a beautiful world. Because when human beings don't have to do drudgery, and government gives you money in the bank, you're going to spend money on entertainment, you're going to spend money and come to Goa and stay, you're going to such nice things. Huh? 
No, actually, basic income referendum was held in Switzerland. 23% of people voted for it. They want to give 2,750 euros to every individual, 975 to a young person below the age of 18, except that they said the Syrians will come and take away. But the movement has started. Bill Gates has said, Mr. Social Security and Robos, Elon Musk has said that, India, Modi wants to give everybody DBT. But isn't this, uh, robots. Mohan, isn't this fascinating? If I look at it from the larger point of view, Capitalism is bringing back uh, socialism by giving uh, equal income to everybody. It is because there is something called the vote, it's the democracy. Trump is saying we'll build back America, yeah, 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 yeah. He's going to build war walls and war, you know, everything else, right? You see, all the Americans will leave and go stay in the Singapore and not pay taxes. Canada. Huh? Canada, uh, Canada has got taxes. So there are, see, the, I'm, I'm saying all this just to get you to understand what is happening and all the disparate events coming together because there's a grand narrative. They're all been disparate, comes together the grand narrative and then the world changes. Which industry are you in? You are in food and beverage industry. How do you make food? You can make food by chemical compound, break it out into compounds and synthesizes and use it. Right? And the whole idea of food, packaged food will come down because human beings will eat less food. They're going to take tablets which meet all their body requirements and they'll be much slimmer. Huh? See? And you're going to get money, get uh, foods which will elongate your life. See, what the Americans did the Americans get processed food, people ate. Then what did they do? They made them eat more by giving them credit cards. So you have a credit. Then because they had more credit, there was bankruptcy. All the companies went bust. The government took over the debt. Now, the consumption-driven society cannot grow because people are not growing. In Japan, population is shrinking. Can consumption grow up? No. Per capita income is going, consumption is not growing up, except in luxuries. When luxuries, you know, you, how much can you buy, right? So we've got to think of new models. Look, I don't have an answer. But what I can tell you is, look at the frontier areas where things are changing in your industry and see how to be there and be ahead of the curve. It's still some way off. Human beings are still going to eat. But look at it. Meat consumption has come down, right? Food per capita consumption has come down because people don't do physical labor. You don't do physical labor, you need 1,500 calories. Physical labor, you need 2,500 calories, right? Correct? And then people are consume liquids instead of chewing and all the kind of stuff, right? They are going to stimulate their mind to get taste. So these things are happening. So the people will have a lesser work to do also? Yes. I mean, right now the Patels have got no work. <laughs> Patels have got no work. The Gujas have got no work. The Jats have got no work. The Tamilians have got no work. The Marathas have got no work. West Bengal never had work. <laughs> So look at that, right? And we are going to come to Goa. We're going to lie in the sun and eat the fish. Somebody is going to work. But you've got to get money, money, money. Uh, more seminars. And IMA will do very well. More seminars, more thought. Hmm? But I, I'm very serious about this. So my suggestion to all of you, look at your industry, see what is happening, and see the change. For example, education. Education has got two components, regulatory aspect, courses, credits, examination, pedagogy, teachers, etc., which is hand of the teachers. They're not going to change because they're all rigid, regulator, blah, blah, blah. But the process of learning is getting disrupted. How do I learn? Because still, the, how, what are the models? Somebody comes here, I read more books than you, I give you information, you write down, pass a silly examination, get a piece of paper, degree. Now, all that information is available on the web. You must learn how to Google. You can Google. And if you want a query, go to Quora, they give you an answer. You go see the best lectures in the world, the best multimedia in the world, you see everything else. All the content, everything is available. You've got to learn how to take all that and solve problems and do an analysis. That's what you've got to learn, not to stuff your head with information. And tomorrow, they'll put a chip in the mind and send all the information of the web here, stored in your memory because your head can store all that memory, so you instant recall. So education is changing. Process of learning is changing. It's already got disrupted. We got a company called Baiju. Heard of Baiju? Yes. 500,000 people are using that. 
They're learning. They're enjoying it. 30,000 per month. He's laughing all the way to the bank. He's worth a billion dollars. He's not paying him. You know, Shah Rukh Khan wants to get inside to show people he's got some brains and he's smart and all that. It's a very different story, but whatever it is. Any other questions? Go up and ask me questions. Pranjal, ask a question, man. Every facet of human activity is undergoing change. It's undergoing change because the availability of technology, availability of big data, algorithm, because there were some problems which could not be modeled. Now they can be modeled and they can be solved in a lifetime. The Big Bang Theory, how did the universe explode and come out of it? You can model it. It requires computing power to come out with an algorithm and use that. Now they're coming close to doing all that. Brilliant, that's what he's doing. He's writing a book. Uh -huh. Written, written. Chaos Wait for published. that. You mean the second book? Ah, uh, second book. The chaos that will follow. And Rekha is going to have more seminars. No, I don't, I think, I don't uh, tell you secret, but, but that is Sanjay's problem next year. <laughs> <laughs> but I think more the, uh, sorry, we need to go ahead. Hmm. Could you elaborate? Year after. <clears throat> oh, Sanjay. The emergence of uh, bitcoins and blockchains in the Indian context. See, blockchains are essentially mechanisms to interact between two individuals in a very secure way, in a read-alone way, but the data belongs to you. Because today all the data is in a central registry, is in a store. And those people like depositories, repositories, settlement thing, they all hold it because they make settlement with institutions, right? The bank holds a ledger and somebody else has a ledger, so they have to interact. Here with the blockchain, I own the blockchain and you and me are going to interact. So it's going to disrupt this centralized ledger keeping and give you more authority about what to do. And that leads to new business models happening. And Bitcoin is, a, is happening now. We've got to see how it works. Because money has got three functions. Money is a store of value. Money is a medium of exchange. Money is a unit of accounting. And the store of value, because Bitcoin is only 20 million, unless they change the algorithm, if they cannot, the store of value could remain. Medium of exchange, people must use it in payment. But it's so volatile, you don't know. Today, I buy something from you, giving Bitcoin $18,000. Tomorrow, it falls to $14,000. I'm dead. OK, that's medium exchange. And unit of accounting is easy to do. So there's still some challenges because central sovereign governments hold this very tight. And by law, they can outlaw it. But you know, in the digital world, everything is OK. So you know, this, we've got to see how it evens out. Right now, there is an unbuilt boom getting. One final question which Mohan, I think they may want to know is how do all leaders, everybody is at a very, uh, you know, important point of their career. How does everybody, how do they remain relevant to the work that they're doing, to the organization that they are in this age of disruption? Because if See, you don't... First, first, we are in the knowledge economy. You need to have knowledge. You need to understand change, the impact of the change, what is happening on the edge. And you've got to sit and analyze, spend two hours reading per day get all the data and see what is happening, see what is competition, reorient your business strategy, become agile, shrink in size, become flexible, correct? It's classic, right? And you need to have the first more advantage. And changing, remember, changing. you don't have to be an innovator, you gotta be first in line. How about changing careers? Huh? Changing careers. Ah, changing careers, you can go wherever, that means you need to be a specialist. See, you need to have a problem solving mindset. That means you need to be, have a capacity to analyze data and to apply the data to problems that arise in business. Because business is a series of problem solving exercises. So you've got to do that. So you've got to develop that expertise. But remember, you know, those of you who are 45 plus, you know, you'll have an easy life till 60. And hopefully you'll have enough money to live by, you so know, forget I, about it. But 25 and coming into work, you're going to have a tough time. You were a CFO. So I want to tell the story which I said, uh, told you about CFO. Uh, so. And this connects to what Shamik was talking about. So the company is Mintra. The Mintra CFO told me that he doesn't have any uh, CAs in his team, only data scientists. He's making a mistake. That's another point. But the fact is that's a disruption. Engineers, no, that's a disruption, but he's making a mistake because engineers can't deliver financial value. But he's speaking like a CFO. <laughs> no, he's speaking because money is coming. He's got to lose another $2 billion. After $2 billion, we'll see. That's true. The, uh, the point is because, that... Because, you know, he's a set of people who says, oh, what is profit? We don't care. What is cash flow? We don't care. We're going to GMB. Now, what is GMB? Gross merchandise value. So what you do is take an apple, discount 20%, the whole world will buy, man. What is a big deal? Sell cell phones, sell apples, sell branded attire, and sell some stupid fashion at 800 bucks. Fashion cannot be 800 bucks. Passion has to be 30,000 bucks. Passion is very unique. 
fashion is not a commodity. No, and say, yeah, 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 I will have uh, unit economics, the rubbish. Unit economics means between the purchase and the sale, I will have a 5% margin. What about your overheads? Because all the returns in e-commerce, 25% is returns, 25% is discount. So 100 sale value, you get only about 40. On 40, you make a loss of 40. So which also means Who's that some of these, these new models will not survive. Well, 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 the going is good because they all, people who invest believe winners takes all. See, let me give, let me give Shana, see, in the United States, if you run a taxi, it's expensive in a taxi. Why? Because there's a license. You've got to pay a license fee. In New York, you've got to get a medallion. Medallion costs $500,000. And you've got a driver. He wants a certain amount of money. And they're very few. So they charge a high fare. Now here comes Uber and says, anybody can drive a taxi. You can do part-time. Part-time means you already have a car. You paid for it or paid half of it. And you're using a surplus time to come. So you can get a cut of 30% because you don't bear all the regulatory costs. And I can make 20%. So essentially, you pay... 30% less is a viable model. You come to India, taxi is available at a bare bone cost. The taxi that you get in the market today, what you pay is enough to pay petrol, pay back the installment, and keep the guy and body and soul together with no surplus. Now, if you cut it down and do, you have to subsidize. Now, you can't sell a 7 rupees a kilometer, it's 20, 18 rupees or 20 rupees. So that model doesn't work. In the price sense environment, the model doesn't work. That's why Alibaba does e commerce. All the producers lose money, they make 5%. Now these guys believe that their life's ambition is to lose more and more money. Money has come in, they got one and a half, two billion dollars left. And you know, I, I, was, I made an interview and said, the big daddy is waiting for them to blow up the money, the geo. Geo is going to come, connect everybody, create the network. And Walmart has come back, you seen that? Huh? So, but Amazon has moved away from uh, selling to AWS where they make $12 billion, $4 billion, that is cloud, cloud architecture, they brought the price down, they got a different lines of business, right? So the business models are changing, and because you want to grow fast, you invest and you create this kind of a thing, but in this winner's take all world, see winner's take world works when you're like a Facebook. Facebook because it is a network impact. You have a network, everybody in the network is difficult. Geo did a, broke the network, I think, done a fantastic job, it's a great case study, right? So uh, this network makes it important. And Google has got a network, unless somebody comes. Apple has got the Apple store, they created networks. So being in the network gives you an advantage for somebody to recreate a network, so they say winners takes all. But in e-commerce, where they're just discounting and selling, it is dumb. Because 65% sales are by people below 35. In my office, in our funds, we got young people, they got seven wallets. Every time they buy something, they say, cone discount, they're there, cash back, they're there, usko jayega. So the Paytm shut shop, wallet is gone. He lost some 3,000 crores, now he's got a payment bank, he said, I'm going to invest 15 to 20,000 crores, and that's the money he's looking forward to give a loss. So, you know, we've got to work out these models, it's got to be a model right. where you deliver value, and you want delivered value, there's somebody called a customer, customer is the only guy who pays. If you give the money and say, I'm the customer, you need an investor, Masa has got $193 billion, 75 from Prince Salman. He's going to change the world. When he blows up $93 billion, we got to see who's the next big sugar daddy to come and pump money. <laughs> Until then, we should enjoy the goods. Thank you so much, Mohan, Thank you. for sharing Thank you your very thoughts. Much. It was, a, I think, a tour de force from the history to the future to, to medical technology to uh, e-commerce uh, uh, platforms. I think he's covered everything. Mohan, please don't go. I'd like to invite Sanjay Kirloskar, Vice President Aima, and uh, CMD Kirloskar Brothers to present you a memento. Thank you.